Welcome to the Elk Talk Podcast with Randy Newberg and Corey Jacobson. Presented by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. The goal is what little you and I know about elk hunting, we share with people. I've got an elk doing it's like 120 yards away. What do I do? First off, the thought would never cross my mind when an elk's being 120 yards away to call anybody on a cell phone. <laughs> All elk. All the time. Only elk. Only elk. Well, it's us having conversations. So we usually go down some rabbit holes. But if you hunt with Corey Jacobson, you will find the landscape is full of rabbit holes. We're just going to make this up as we go. And you look at it like, oh, that's a target rich environment. But if you're trying to single one out, a solo target there is much easier to go into than a, a big group. Well, we record everything, so there's no BS and no lying, no faking it with us. <laughs> Did we hit the record I button? I forgot to hit the record <laughs> button. If you want to know something about elk hunting, this probably isn't a podcast to listen to. <laughs> Could we give them a list of all the other podcasts wow. where they might learn something? <laughs> The Elk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, ensuring the future of elk, other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. To become a member, go to rmef.org. And the podcast is also brought to you by OnX Maps. And with OnX Maps, you can know where you stand with the most accurate hunting GPS tech on the market with land ownership maps that work offline. Go to onxmaps.com and use promo code ELKTALK and you're going to save 20% when you sign up for an app membership at onxmaps.com. The podcast is also brought to you by Gerber. Uh, go to gerbergear.com and learn about the knives, the vital, the big game vital, the Gator Premium, all the things that we use when we're out in the woods and not just knives, but also some really cool multi-tools that they have. We're also proud to partner with Sitka Gear. And if you go to sitkagear.com, you'll see their full line of clothing. And their tagline is turning clothing into gear. And they are doing that through advanced technology that allows you to stay in the field longer, hunt harder, and stay safer. The Elk Talk podcast is also brought to you by GoHunt.com. Uh, go to GoHunt.com and sign up for the Insider. Um, the, the insider is changing how haunts and hunting information are found. No doubt about that. Use promo code ELKTALK, and when you do, when you sign up for the insider, you're going to get $50 of store credit, mad money, in their gear shop. And we are also brought to you by Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. And Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls is the original designer and inventor of the pallet plate diaphragm that's completely changed the way elk calls are made and used. And to find out more and to order your elk calls, go to RockyMountainHuntingCalls.com or BuglingBull.com and use promo code ELKTALK and you're going to save 15% on all of your elk calls and elk call accessories. And with that, Corey... We are ready to get into it. Let's jump into it. So do, do you think we got to tell the audience how this works? We probably better explain it. All right. Not that anyone's paying attention right now, but... If you have a green popsicle, you have to ask a question first. Oh, you're on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we got a live mic right over here. And uh, please don't be bashful. Go up to that mic and ask your question. And Corey and I will do our best to make up an answer that gets nobody divorced and nobody in trouble. <laughs> uh, I see some people here who know me, and so that's not good because their BS meters are pretty good. They're, you're going to have to answer most of the questions, Corey. Well, as long as they aren't marital questions, all right. I'll be all right. So here's how it works. Uh, you go up to that mic and ask a question, and we'll try our best to answer it. And... and and, and we have a backpack and a box full of free gear to hand out. So Ooh. Sam is going to help us with that. So once you ask a question, Sam is going to hand out the gear. So if you don't answer, ask a question, you're not going to get any of this swag here from Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. So. All right. Mike's open. Mike's open. Who's got? <laughs> all right. You, you got to repeat the question. Yeah. So the guy said, Randy, how did you become the least cool CPA to ever walk the earth? 
<laughs> and uh, I don't know. That's you know, not what I heard. Oh, okay. I don't know. I All the time that I was a CPA, I've been a CPA for 32 years, people would come into my office and I smiled a lot. And they're like, you're not like most CPAs. <laughs> and it took me a long time to figure out what they were talking about. But uh, I don't know. That doesn't have anything to do with elk hunting. He's not like most elk hunters either. So there's a no, trend. I, I'm below average at all of them. So <laughs> there you go. So see, because this is in Big Sky, Montana, and my, I, my house is only about 40 miles down the road, Corey's got to answer the really tough questions because those of you locals who know me are going to call me out when you see me at the coffee shop next week. So <laughs> if you see me deflecting and giving Corey the question, it's because I don't know the answer. And if I lied, too many people here know me too well. So All right. So but. if you're from Bozeman, raise your hand. Okay. Oh, they're, they're back. Okay. The That's not too bad. All right. All right. So. We'll filter those questions. Okay. So... That, that was a, a primer question, but uh, anyone got a real elk hunting? Oh, here we go. All right. Someone's going to come and ask a real question here. If I remember right, I've heard part of this story already, and your hunting partner got distracted by a grouse right then, right? Okay. So the question is, you've got a five point all by himself on an open hillside 200 yards away, 200 yards away, and he just stands there and bugles. What do you do? Okay. Number one. You have to work year-round to make sure your hunting partner realizes elk are the priority, not grouse. Don't. The, the, so one of the things, Corey, <laughs> I warn some of the audience, there's certain topics they can't bring up because it results in conflict between the co-hosts. <laughs> and the very first question is one of those two topics. The two topics are moon phases and grouse hunting. So, all right. Finish. And we're okay on dilly bars? Everyone's, uh, that's unanimous. Okay, we're yeah. good on dilly bars. Anyone so. who doesn't like dilly bars, leave now. <laughs> All right, 200 yards, you got a five-point bull elk, uh, probably a satellite bull by himself, bugling his head off, but he won't come in? So I guess, give me a little more information. Where are you? Are you across to a ravine from him? Yeah, so, there's a little creek right in the bottom. He's about halfway up this little timbered ridge. And what time of the day? So thermals are coming uphill? Yes. Okay, so you're across the ravine from the bull elk. He's over on an open hillside straight across from you, 200 yards. So in order for him to come into your calls, he's going to have to drop down into the bottom and then come straight up the hill to you. Okay, so a couple things come to mind there. Number one, when a bull elk is coming up a hill, he's coming into another bull elk. He doesn't think there's a 160-pound human there. He thinks there's an 800-pound bull elk that wants to beat him up. So coming uphill, he's going to be at a physical disadvantage. So a bull elk is going to be less likely to charge up a hill to a challenge. Uh, if you can get on the same level as him, he's going to be a lot more likely to come in. He's going to feel more physically protected. The other thing is, is he's, he knows he's in a place where he's got a visual advantage. He's up high there, and he also has a, an advantage when it comes to the thermals. Because the second you hit the bottom of the creek, your scent's going to go up to him. So he's going to stand there because he's protected. So in that situation, what I would do is probably try to go up the drainage a little bit, get on his level, and come straight into him and get him in, in the timber where you have a little bit of cover. And if you can get on that same level as that bull, he's not going to have the physical advantage. He's not going to feel like he has a physical disadvantage. Uh, visually, he's not going to have an advantage, and he's going to feel somewhat protected by thermals and feel safe coming into the calls. So, great question, though. Yeah. See. If it has to do with elk calling, that, that's going to be directed towards Corey. Everyone's nodding in agreement. They've heard me call. They're like, thank goodness. All right, who's next? So the question is, if you, are, if you have a plan A, plan B, plan C, how long do you give plan A before you leave to plan B? Um, that depends, but as a general rule, uh, when I say plan A, that's going to be in a general area that I might have five or six spots on the spot in plan A. I might have another four, five, six in spot B and in and, and, and plan C. I will usually give my, my A spot or A area, I'm going to give that at least all of opening morning and I'm going to move to different spots throughout that 
area because I don't want to say, oh, I have this area and only have one spot in that area. And especially in rifle season, I am moving from glassing location to glassing location to glassing location. And I'll give that at least a whole day. And if I'm not seeing any sign or it looks like the Dead Sea, I'm pulling stakes and I'm going to area B the next day. But if I'm seeing something or I saw a bull disappear into the timber, I don't leave elk to find elk. I make sure I either blew them out of there or I packed them out of there before I go to the next spot. But in archery, I'll let Corey answer how he would do that in archery season. Yeah, and it's, it's really similar. So I, I rely on calls. I mean, I'll walk by 20 bulls that aren't bugling to find one that is. And I'll, I'll walk by 26 points to find one five point that's bugling if that's what it takes because I want to call them in. And so if I'm in an area and I'm not getting any responses, I don't go back to that area the next day. I'm into another area. In fact, that evening, I'm probably hunting a different area and I'm continually bouncing. It might be just a mile up the road in a different drainage. It might be the other side of the unit, depending on what my plan A, plan B is. But I just don't get stuck in a rut because once you get stuck in it, I've talked to way too many people that, hey, I hunted Colorado for eight days last year and didn't hear a single bugle, didn't see a single track. And the first thing is, is did you hunt the same area all season? Yeah, I was just waiting for the elk to show up. Elk sometimes don't show up. So I'm, I'm pretty aggressive when it comes to pulling up stakes and heading to a new, new area. So. There's the old saying, if you always do what you always done, you'll always get what you always got. That applies to elk hunting. So the question is, hunting a burn area, how, how soon after, how long can you continue hunting it? Basically, how long or how soon after the burn is the area effective to hunt? Is that go, for me? Go ahead, yeah. All right. Uh, <clears throat> I will usually hunt a burn the next year. I've been to places where there's been a burn in May, say in Arizona, New Mexico, and I come back in October, and there are already, already elk using that. Normally, I'm hunting a burn that's at least one year old, hopefully two, three, four, and... I will hunt that until it becomes a burn or, or until another burn comes within that general area that's now the new burn. I'm always hunting the newest burn in the area I'm hunting. And sometimes, I mean, I'm hunting areas right now, the burns are 15 years old, but they're still the newest burn in the area. And it, it, there's a lot of dependent factors, uh, the soil types, the intensity of the burn, the, the vegetation w as to how quickly that burn area recovers and becomes productive. So a little bit of is playing it by ear and just seeing how it responds. But as a general rule, I'm hunting it the next year and until another burn becomes a newer burn. And I just, I always hunt the newest burn in the unit and people say, well, now everyone else does that too, or you know, everyone is gonna do that. Well, not all burns are created equal. Uh, burns in certain soil types are not gonna recover as fast as burns in other soil types. And then I don't go hunt, but I mean, sometimes I have to, we hunt burns that are 30,000 acres, but I really love those five, 600 acre burns that are a little bit tucked away that nobody knows unless they turn down their on X layer that has the burn layer. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I, it's no secret. Everyone sees our footage and sees our images and they're like, you even kill antelope and burns. Yep. I shoot grouse and burns, I shoot deer and burns, I hunt elk and burns. It, it just, he takes it, naps and burns. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dang, I guess I spend a lot of time. But that, <laughs> uh, when it comes to burns, that, that's how I approach it. And sometimes there's not a burn in a unit. So I look for what is the other canopy disruption? Because really what a burn is, in addition to the nutrients and nitrogen cycling that goes into the soil, it really is a canopy disruption. So there can be avalanche shoots. There can be a big wind shear that comes through, blows a bunch of stuff down. There are all kinds of things that create canopy disruptions, and I'm looking for those. Yeah, and just to add to that, we've actually hunted elk in a burn, in an active burn, where the area is shut down you know, as far as roads and everything, we've hiked in there and the elk were in the middle of the smoke, stumps still on fire, and we're calling elk in. In fact, if you go to, our, to the Elk 101 YouTube channel, uh, about probably six weeks ago, there's a video, I don't remember the name of it, but if you look for it, big heavyset guy, David Burdett, 
A good friend of mine shot a bull at 20 yards, a 340 inch bull, public land, over the counter tag in Idaho. And we literally, I think the bull came in because there was so much smoke he couldn't smell and the wind was going right at him. And you think about how good their smelling, you know, their sense of smell is. Our noses burn when we get in smoke from a fire. And so for them, it just has to be complete shutdown on their senses. And he came walking right with the wind going right at him to us. And I think he shot him at 20 yards or 23 yards. But we hunted that. Uh, I hunted in Colorado one year. There was a burn, like Randy said, in May or June. And by September, the grass was green and this tall because it just rained all summer after that. And it was just a light burn that went through and the elk were thick in there. And then we've got areas in Idaho that it looks like the moon 20 years after the fire went through. There's not a single green thing that has grown there in the last 20 years and there's no elk there. So finding the right burn. And then like Randy said, that, that canopy disruption, the creation of a fringe area where you've got one habitat, you know, good sanctuary bedding area with really good lush feed. Those are kind of the, the areas to target. Yeah, and, and with burns, I hunt, like if there's a little finger of a burn that goes out there, I'm not hunting the big center core of the burn usually. When Corey's talking about that fringe, that edge habitat, those are the places that, the, one, there's excellent feed right there, and there's also security cover, and the elk are gonna feel comfortable coming out of the green timber right on the edge and feeding there. And so I'm, I'm hunting these little fingers and pockets in a burn not the big core central area of a burn. Unless there are, unless, I mean, you can see elk in a burn really easy. If they're right out in the middle, well, yeah, I guess that's where I'm gonna go. But as a general rule, I'm not hunting in the middle of the burn. This will be a question for Corey. Uh, <laughs> the question is, how do I get the herd bull to leave his cows or to not pack up his cows and head up the mountain when I start trying to call them in? That, okay. So, and that's a great question. I think one of the most common issues we struggle with is pulling the herd bull away from his cows. And there are a lot of factors there to think about. You know, earlier in the season, a herd bull that isn't herded up yet is a really good target. He's an easier target. He's still territorial. He's still aggressive, dominant, but he hasn't got his cows yet. So if you can find them early, I like to hunt big bulls from like the 3rd to the 8th or 10th of September because they don't usually have their cows then. But man, if you can get them talking and getting close to them, they come in on a string sometimes. So they aren't a technical herd bull. They don't have a herd of cows, but in two weeks from now, they're gonna be the herd bull. Once they get herded up, that, that transition from like the third to the 10th is good. They're usually not with the cows. And then from like the 10th to the 16th, 17th, and it varies a day or two in different areas. But during that time, that's when they're establishing dominance. That's when they're saying, I'm gonna be the herd bull. So that's a great time to call them as well because they're gonna come in, they're gonna fight off the other bull, they're gonna prove they're the herd bull. Once from like the 17th on, once cows start coming into estrus, those bulls have their attention strictly on the cows. And so turning it away to even a challenging bull can be incredibly difficult. So there's a couple things. Number one is you have to get close to that herd bull. You have to get inside probably 120 or 150 yards, really put pressure on him to pull him away from the cows. And that you'll see it a lot of times, you know, if you go someplace where you can observe elk, you've got all these satellite bulls running around, the herd bulls just going frantic back and forth, trying to keep his cows lined up. And all of a sudden the satellite bull gets too close, the herd bull turns and runs at him and chases him off and then goes back to the herd. But he's not running 400 yards across the meadow to chase off a satellite bull. That satellite bull has to get inside that red zone area. So you're gonna have to get closer before you set up and start calling and you're gonna have to get pretty aggressive. And so I would just say, if you can get inside 100 or 120 yards, get the bull's attention, get him to answer a cow call and then hammer him with a challenge bugle. And it's not gonna work every time. Some bulls are just, that cow's in estrus, it doesn't matter, he's not leaving. From there, the other tactic I like to use is just a shadowing tactic where if you're in an area where the terrain and the timber allows for it, that bull is pretty dynamic right now. You know, if he's not coming into your calls, it's because he's so focused on cows. So he's running from cow to cow and he's moving around. So if you can get inside and just keep slipping in close and putting yourself in a position where that bull may come running through or wandering through, you might get a shot. But for me, it's, it's all calling. And so I really hit him really heavy with that challenge. But again, you have to get close. And once you get close, it can turn that. Even the biggest herd bulls will come into a bugle sometimes if you push the right buttons. And one other thing, if you have a caller behind you and you're the shooter out in front, you know, that can be difficult because now you're 40, 50 yards in front of the caller. The caller's back. You can only get 120 yards from the elk as the shooter. The caller's another 40 or 50 yards back. 
we do what we call the slingshot. And so the, the, the shooter out in front actually puts the pressure on the bull with the calls and pushes the buttons and challenges him. And then once that bull commits and starts coming in, the caller back behind takes over and finishes it. So kind of like the closer in a baseball game, the last little bit, that caller behind pulls him into the shooting lane and, and gets you a shot as the shooter. So great question. Randy, anything to add to that? I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> I could make it up, but uh, I'm no. Who's the next person with a great question? Are you guys all bashful? What are we going to have to make it up for you? <laughs> so again, this is an archery uh, event, so pretty much everyone's interested in how to call in elk, and so I'm, I'm kind of here as just the narrator. Uh, when you have the what, 43rd time champion world elk calling title next to you, you let him do the talking. Uh, but this one was about using challenge bugles. Is that right? Yep. Okay. When, where, and how, and, and why would you use a challenge bugle in certain situations? Is that? Okay. So my, my calling strategy is incredibly simple. And I, for me, it has to be simple because I'll mess it up if it's not. I use a location bugle to locate an elk. And once I get that bull located, I'm getting as close to him as I can get. No more calling at all. I just, I, I locate him, I pinpoint him. If he's 400 yards up the canyon, I get the wind in my favor. I figure out where he's going to be or where the wind's going to be. I find a good setup location and I move straight to him. Once I get into that, then I set up my calling strategy and it's basically just a cow call and a challenge bugle. And the, the thing about the challenge bugle you have to remember, it's not going to be effective from 400 yards away. You've got to get in close. And again, that 120 to 150 yard range is the most effective. It'll still work at 200, 250. But if you want to see a bull come unglued and one bugle be in your lap, the closer you can get, the better. And so I get in as close as I can. I get a good setup. I make sure the wind's good. I have shooting lanes. I give out a cow call or two. The bull responds to the cow call and immediately I hammer him. And it's, you've got to put emotion into it. And we talked about it last week at the calling contest. There are human judges behind the screen but they still sense that emotion. They can tell there was a caller there. I talked to him afterwards, incredible caller, but his chuckles put you to sleep. They're so smooth and just, they're phenomenal sounding, but there was no emotion in them. And if you put emotion in it, you can feel that emotion and the elk can feel that emotion. I think that's how they communicate more so than with a language. And so you've got to, you've got to really get aggressive. You hit that high note and you scream a challenge at him. You yell at that elk and you tell him, you can't talk to my cow. You're a loser. You're not the big bull on the mountain. Why don't you come in here and prove, you know, come to me. You're, you're issuing the challenge, putting the ball in his court. On the flip side, if you get close to that bull and you let out a bugle, just maybe to see where he's at, or maybe you throw out a challenge bugle first, he's almost always going to immediately respond with a challenge. And he's going to stand there and wait for you to come to him because he's issued the challenge. So it's so important that you issue that challenge. And again, Herd bulls, little bulls, some people say you can't use aggressive bugling because you're going to scare off all the little bulls. We've had spikes come in with their eyes rolled back with slobber dripping off of their nose. They don't know what they're doing. They just lost their mind. Something triggered in them. That testosterone dropped. And now here they are standing there with fuzzy little horns screaming a bugle at you going, I don't know what I'm doing and you might be a big six point, but it's a natural reaction and you trip the trigger and here I am. And so little bulls, big bulls, it, it works for that. The getting close is definitely the key. And it, I, I put it back to human psychology. If there's somebody across at the practice range right here, and I'm sitting here with Randy and I say, hey, that's a terrible shot. He's probably gonna turn around and look at me and just not give it much attention. But if he's sitting right here in the front row and I get right in his face and I say, you are an idiot, you're a loser, you're a horrible shot with a bow in front of all these people, I'm probably gonna get punched in the nose. Okay, elk are the same way. If you get in close and this bull's up there and all of a sudden he hears this cow and he's like, huh, it's September. There's a cow by yourself. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? And all of a sudden, before he even gets that out, this other bull challenges him and says, uh-uh, I'm in your face. This is my cow. You're an idiot. Don't talk to my cow. He's coming and swinging. So it's really playing to the emotions and getting inside the head of that elk. What can I do to make him want to fight? And once you make that bull want to fight, he comes in on a string pretty quickly. So. I do have something to add to that. And Corey, twice he mentioned wind, getting the wind in your favor. 
And I've hunted with a lot of people. And the first time I hunted with Corey, I thought he'd lost his mind. We would hear an elk bugle 250 yards away, and we'd take a three-mile loop to go 250 yards, <laughs> all because of the wind. And I was paying close attention because I always thought, I think I can just, instead of a three-mile loop, I'll just do like a 500-yard loop, and I'll cheat the wind up over here. It'll just be a short little distance. Well, usually, you scare that elk off. So I... Corey takes it for granted because it's so ingrained in how he does it and how careful he has to be for his methods to work. You cannot discount the wind. I just, when I hear you talk and explain versus when I watch you hunt, you take for granted everyone else has this high paranoia about wind that you do. <laughs> and most of us are human and we're inherently lazy and think there's a shortcut. And there is no shortcut to keeping the wind in your face, so... I'll, I'll add to that. Where's Donnie? Donnie, can I embarrass you really quickly? <laughs> That's what he's here for, he said. So Donnie and I started hunting together 12, 15 years ago. And at that point, Donnie had hunted elk, I think, 17 years with a bow and had not filled an elk tag with his bow. And that year, our area was on fire. The roads were all closed. And I was just telling Donnie at work, man, my area is closed. I don't know where we're going to hunt. And he said... I've got an area that I always get into elk. I've never killed one there, but every time I've been there, I've got into elk and you're welcome to go there. And so I think it was 11 o'clock opening morning. We were packing my bull out of this area and Donnie, I went back to work the next Monday and he's like, you killed a bull in there first day? I'm like, yeah, it was awesome. Thanks so much for the area. That's, you know, there are elk everywhere. And I said, let's go next weekend. So the next weekend, Donnie and I go in there. We park in the same place. Donnie told me to park. We walk up the same ridge. Donnie told me to walk up. And we get on the point and I let out a bugle and a bull answers down in the bottom. And Donnie gets a smile on his face and starts right down to the bottom after that elk. I'm like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? And he's like, the bull's answering down there, we gotta get down there. And I pull out my puffer and the wind's blowing right down to that bull. So for 17 years, Donnie had been hunting the same way, getting up high in the morning, calling and then dropping down in there. And I said, we've got to circle all the way around this basin, get clear around on the other side, wait for the bull to make his way up to the bedding area and then get on the same elevation because if he smells us, before we even get 400 yards from him, he's gone. And Donnie shot a bull that weekend in that area that he'd hunted for 17 years. And it just, it, it, like Randy said, it's something I've taken for granted, but it's probably the number one key to being successful as an elk hunter especially, you have to pay attention to the wind. And you have to not only think about what it's doing right then, but what it's doing in 15 minutes, what it's doing on the hillside where the elk is opposed to where you are. And the thermals are so completely erratic in, in mountain terrains with the diurnal changes. You just, you have to understand thermals and you have to obey them because an elk lives by its nose. It never forgets thermals unless you can trip that trigger for about 15 seconds on a bull and get him to just come right in. Other than that, every movement they make, every area they bed in, every area they feed in, everything they do is focused on the wind and staying alive by their sense of smell, so. Who's next? All right, here comes a guy after my own heart. He came up here and told me a grouse hunting story earlier. I all think the, he was the one, by all, the way, that was 200 yards from the five-point bull that was bugling and all, chased a grouse. All the way from Kalispell, right? <laughs> So the question is, first one, should you chase a grouse if you have a bull bugling at 200 yards away? The answer to that is definitely no. What was the second question? <laughs> so question, uh, you've been hunting four years, you haven't filled a tag yet. Is there one piece of just hidden advice or just what's, the, what's gonna push you over the edge there to be successful? What, what can we offer there? And then the second question is for your wife and her twin sister who are new to hunting, What's a piece of advice for somebody brand new to hunting? Okay, Randy. I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that because it took me six years to kill an elk. So yeah, yeah, according to the Randy Newberg calendar, you got two more years of hard time before <laughs> you're gonna punch a tag. Uh, but if there was one thing that kind of got me over the hump where all of a sudden I'm like, oh, why was I making this so hard? Um, and I was primarily a rifle hunter uh, at that time and I probably am more now still but uh it was knowing more about the elk i made elk a subject of study i wanted to know what they ate i wanted to know where they bedded why they did what they did how often did they have to water in the rut how, the, all these things that helped me 
get a little bit further in an elk's mind. Because I came through this process that I thought, well, if I go buy a new gadget or a new wind checker or some sort of spray or something, that's going to get me there. And I spent lots and lots of money on gizmos and doodads that still didn't get me there. What got me there was knowing more about elk and making even just every mistake I would get frustrated. But in retrospect, now I realize those were some of my most valuable learning experiences were the mistakes that I made along the way. Um, I, I wish I could tell you, oh, you're, this is what you aren't doing. And if you do that tomorrow, you know, you're going to wake up with a elk in your freezer. Uh, I don't think there's any simple answer like that. You know, and it, I think it really comes down to just putting in the work. And like Randy said, it's going to take time. Sometimes it happens the first year and it just clicks. Um, you look at success rates and success rates on public land over the counter, general type hunts is about 10%. So one in 10 hunters every year fill their elk tag. Or if you want to put it in into the perspective of, of you've hunted for four years, you're going to kill an elk once every 10 years as an average hunter. And so when you look at it like that, what's the average hunter doing? I think it goes back to business or anything. The ones who are successful are the ones who put in the work. And if you're willing to put in the work more than average, you're going to have better than average success. And Randy and I both, I think, use the phrase, knowledge equals confidence and confidence equals success. And so the more you can learn about elk, the more confident you're going to be. And I think there's probably eight or 10 different areas of uh, elk hunting that you need to put in work to gain that confidence. Shooting bow, you're here this weekend shooting your bow. You're extending your range to give you more confidence at actual hunting ranges. Uh, physical conditioning, there's so much out there, just elk hunting knowledge. So all of that contributes to your success. And the faster, the more work you put in to gain that confidence faster, I think the sooner you're gonna have success. And the more consistently you're gonna have that success. If there was one thing as an archery hunter that I would focus on, it would be your setup. So when you're calling elk in September, you can get elk to answer. You can get into elk, you can scout elk, you can find elk, you can shoot your bow, you can physically get there, but more elk hunts fall apart at the setup than I think any other phase of the hunt. And the reason why is elk are coming in, you're in their, you're in their quarters at that point. They're usually hyper aware, they're using their senses, trying to overcome their senses and get it set up in an area where they actually feel safe coming in, but they aren't safe. And then you just think about all the excuses about why you didn't fill your tag. You know, you hit a limb on a shot. You got, you finally got a shot and you miss. You're laughing. Did you, did you get a shot? You've had a shot. So, so you've been successful. The shot just didn't work out. So there's something there that needs tweaked. You know, you learn from that mistake, but you just think about that t-shirt that says there's 99 reasons why I didn't fill my elk tag. It's, I set up behind a tree. I hit a limb. I, you know, all these things that are set up centric. So really focus on your setup and visualize what a perfect setup is and then try to try to implement that more than not. And as far as uh, information for your wife and twin sister, uh, I, I don't have anything specific other than almost echoing what Corey said about experience is the greatest teacher. Don't view a failed set up or just a day in the woods of not seeing anything as a failure. We, we like to think that any day we don't uh, fill a tag, somehow that's a failure. And to me, it's not. I'm learning every time I go out there. I'm, maybe it is a mistake or maybe it's, I, I didn't even make a mistake that day, but I didn't find any elk and it causes me to think, well, why didn't I find any elk? Um, and the other thing I find is the more fun I make it, the more it interests me and the harder I work at it. So don't, don't hunt for anyone else's reasons. Don't feel any pressure. Hunt for your own reasons and try to have fun with it. And I think you'll, it, you'll get there. It, it'll be way easier if you view it as fun and not work. Yeah, there's, there's not much to add to that. I know with children, for me, it was a, it was a shift to hunting with my children because it was, I was very selfish. It was me and my hunt and it had to, I had my definition of success. And when I have an 11 year old son who I'm hunting with now, I have to make it about them. I have to make it fun for them and think about what's his goal, you know? And unfortunately my 
son who's now 16, his goal was to kill an elk every year with a bow and put a pretty tall order on dad. But just, I mean, for your wife, what's your goal? Is it to hear an elk scream in your face? Is it to fill a tag? I mean, establish that goal and then make that the success. And if it's to kill an elk on your first hunt, then you've got a tall order, but it can happen. So but keep it fun. And that's at the end of the day, we're so incredibly blessed to be able to hunt elk on public land and take a week off from work and go out and just chase elk. And whether we fill a tag or not, we have to look at that experience as this is something that 90% of the population will never experience, let alone be able to have the opportunity to be successful as an elk hunter. So just keep it in perspective at all times and success will come at the level you want it to come and it'll come as you earn it. The other secret to that, and this is a bit of marital advice. Uh oh, here we go. Don't let your husband give you a bunch of hand-me-downs, all right? <laughs> if he tries to give you a bunch of hand-me-downs, he's a tightwad. Okay, <laughs> you need as good of a bow as he has. You need as good of clothing as he has. You know, how many times do we see guys like, well, yeah, I got Poor a brand guy. new $3,000 rifle and I sent my wife out with grandpa's 3030 with open sights. How much fun you suppose she's going to look? He's laughing. He's guilty. Look at that. She's blushing and he's laughing. So Randy, Randy always says, if you're planning on spending $1,000 to go elk hunting, you better plan on spending 2500 that's a thousand for you, a thousand for her, and five hundred for the family budget. There you go. No charge for that advice. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? All right, now we're talking. We're talking late season. So he the said, question is Oh, yeah. The mid mid to late November. How how late will the elk stay out in the middle of the day and how early in the afternoon will you see him come back out feeding? So, Randy, definitely a question for you. All right. Uh People get tired of hearing me talk about the five calendar periods of elk, but this calendar period is what I call the late season, anything after November 1st. Sanctuary is their number one priority at that time, followed by food. So depends on if it's a highly pressured area or a limited entry area or a general area, because hunting pressure definitely has something to do with how late they'll stay out in the morning and how early they'll come out in the afternoon. But even if you can get to it, what I call a true sanctuary, that bull is usually going to be in a bachelor group by that time. Uh, post rut, you know, October 20th, 25th, they're still single. But by early November, they're starting to group up into groups of two, three, four, five. They're going to these sanctuaries. And if they're undisturbed, and, and then the, this hunting pressure also gets into not just the time of the season, but the day of the week. I will see times where, I, and I go through my journals, where Thursday, the elk have a tendency to stay out a little later in the morning and they come out a little earlier in the afternoon because the pressure from Saturday, Sunday has started to subside again. And so they're starting to feel a little bit more comfortable. So as far as a, a time frame in the day, it, it really depended upon the proximity to trails and roads and hunting pressure. But there's no doubt that as temperatures decrease, their requirement for more metabolic intake, calories, whatever you want to call it, increases, and they have to stay out later. They, they have no choice. Flip side of that is don't leave the truck at shooting light. If you leave the truck at shooting light, you should have just stayed at home and watched football that day. I mean, you want to be back to those sanctuary areas about the time shooting light starts, and you want to stay there until shooting light ends. And well, you better be handy with a headlamp and navigating with your on X system because public land elk are pressured by that time. They've probably already had in a lot of states, archery seasons, a muzzleloader season. Uh, some states have an early rifle and a mid rifle. And so about November, they are dialed in to what hunting pressure has done, which is what has put them in sanctuary mode. But uh, I, I stay out there all day long. Some people watch our footage and they're like, Newber, you must be the most boring guy in the world to hunt with. You sat there all day looking through those optics. Yep. Because I know there are elk there. I've seen their tracks in the snow. Historically, I've hunted it. And I know that year after year, they like to use the same sanctuary areas. But uh, 
be there all day because if if it is Thursday and Friday and the hunting pressure has subsided, yeah, they might be out for an hour after shooting light instead of just 15 minutes. And yeah, they might come out an hour before the end of shooting light instead of a half hour before. Uh, but be there because don't take for granted that they have a calendar that they're worried about or a daily schedule. They don't, they don't have to be home for dinner. You know, they haven't made a commitment to the boss that, yeah, I'll be in tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. Uh, they just got to stay alive. That's their number one priority. So they're going to do whatever helps them stay alive till tomorrow morning. You got to be there at all hours of the day, ready to go. And just know that in November, the later in November, the more fun it is to hunt elk, even though they aren't big one. We'll find out. Randy and I are hunting elk in November this year together, and he, he tells a pretty good story there about staying out all day, but I've archery hunted with him, and so maybe his, that, his strategy is a little different in September than November, but I remember him asking me during September, so what time is the typical midday madness, like middle of the day rutting activity, what time does that start? And I said, you know, 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock is usually prime time, and he looked at his watch and said, we have time to make it back to the truck and down to Dairy Queen and back up here by... 10 30 or 11 so staying out all day doesn't necessarily mean staying out all day it's there's if there's a dairy queen close <laughs> yeah and Corey's got the worst taste in ice cream you've ever seen the folks at the west yellowstone dairy queen were like where'd you get this guy man <laughs> <laughs> randy did randy you, did educate me on quality ice cream right, so I, uh, I no longer eat ice cream at sonic no so that's blasphemy there that's a great question. Oh, uh, you, you, you read the question and you answer it because I'll make it a too long of a question. Okay, so, so wolf hunting or elk hunting in wolf country. <laughs> okay, I'll ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> when you're calling to elk and there are wolves in the area, how do you get the elk to respond and, and what do you do differently than normal? Is that, does that kind of say it? Yeah, right. so th there is no doubt if you have spent any time in elk country where there are wolves, wolves have changed the landscape. And love it or hate it, they're here, and we have to deal with it. And it makes elk hunting tougher. There's, there is no way around it. Nobody can argue the fact that elk hunting is harder because the wolves are here. And population-wise, I know there's areas where the, the wolves have an effect on the population, and it's harder to find elk. And... I live in an area like that where the elk are now just in pockets and you have to cover so much more country just to find that pocket of elk. And the other thing is wolves are continually on the move. They are continually on the hunt. And so that makes the elk continually on the move to stay ahead of them or away from them. And so where you find elk one day, uh, three days later, they might be six miles away because of that. And so now we're seeing elk that are making big circular patterns through areas just to continually stay on the move. And a lot of times they just aren't comfortable staying in this one draw all fall. Uh, the other thing is elk know that when they bugle now, they're a dinner bell. And so they aren't as vocal. So you don't get out a lot of times in heavy wolf country and hear six bulls bugling for four hours in the morning and just that chaos that we got used to for a long time. So strategy wise, uh, I'll, I'll tell a quick story just to illustrate it. But a few years back, we had a, a canyon where there were six or seven bulls that we could see all the way up this canyon on different finger ridges that we could see within five or 600 yards of us. And at daylight, we're glassing and we're like, okay, this one's here, there's this one here. And I let out a bugle and they didn't even lift their head and look, didn't even look at us, just kept feeding on the open hillside. And I thought, well, they certainly can hear us. So after about a half hour of this, finally about 70 yards below us, a big herd bull's moving up the draw and he just lets out this, oh, and that's all we got out of him. And he's pushing four or five cows and they go right by us, right up to the ridge and away from us. And I thought, that's not normal for an elk to do that. I'm 70 yards from him bugling my head off and he's trying to get away from me, going by me to get away from me. We get on the ridge and you guessed it, there's fresh wolf tracks there on the ridge. We completely left that area, went down Canyon 10 miles, went on the other side of the Canyon and hunted a drainage and the elk were screaming, like literally it all day long bugling. And then a week later, we came back to that same area and the elk that were in there were now bugling because the wolves had moved on. So we can't get stuck hunting an area where the wolves are actively at because elk, and, and I say this generally, because I've had elk answer wolf howling. Wolves howling across the canyon and the elk laying in his bed just answering. I'm like, 
bring it on, come on over here. And so it's a generalized statement, but I think you've got to get closer to them to get them to respond. You're going to have to do more location bugles to get one response instead of just getting there and bugling and four bulls answering you. Now you're going to have to work to get that one response. And then to get them to come in, you're going to have to get close to them and make them feel safe. They're going to come in more wary. They're more on edge now because of so much predation around them. And the area we hunted in Wyoming a few years ago, grizzlies everywhere, wolves everywhere, huge wolf packs everywhere. And those elk, when they came in, didn't just drop their guard. They came in and they'd take three steps and stop and they'd scan everything and they'd lift their nose and then they'd back out 15 yards and circle around. I mean, they're just so cautious. So strategy wise, it's going to take more work. You're going to have to get in close and then go find the bull that's not being harassed by wolves that day that feels today's my day to bugle. And you're going to have to cover a lot more country to do that and find that one bull. So great question. And that's from the guy who lives in ground zero of the wolf reintroduction. So um, I'll take that as the gospel. Uh, it's not the gospel, but we, uh, I, if, I, other, if I can it, just it, talk it, about wolf hunting. It could just be that maybe you weren't calling very good that day and they didn't like what you had to say. If you hunt with Corey, he does all this stuff and you're like, well, what'd you tell him? Well, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not there to tell him a story. <laughs> All right. I'm there to pack them out. <laughs> uh, who's next? Oh, wow. This is going to be a long answer. So the question is, if you are traveling to a new, new area, this person, he every time he has to hunt, it's out of state. So you maybe don't live in an elk state. Uh, that, that's kind of how it is for me, too. I, I travel a lot to hunt. I, uh, so the question is, how do you build a plan so that when you get there, you're not surprised by what you thought was going to be a good plan? How did you, you know, whether it's terrain, topography, thickness, stuff like that. But, and I think maybe to add to that, how do you determine where to hike to to get to vantage points to either call in, early, in, in the rut or to glass in the later season? Because... Like say, all you have is access to e-scouting. So you're showing up ready to hunt and you might look at an area online. How do you pick out those areas? So I'll start and I'll, I'll talk about bugling because it's easier than glassing. But when you're looking at Google Earth, you can put it in 3D and you can get a good visual of what the area looks like. I mean, it's a, it's a realistic representation. Don't be fooled by it. It's always steeper than it looks on Google Earth. It will always be steeper, no matter what angle you're at. Uh, but the thing I look for, I look for feed areas, I look for water areas, and I look for bedding areas. So if I can find those three things, I find a north face, a good dark north face, that's a good bedding area. If it's a bench or a, a bench on a saddle on a finger ridge that's on a north face, that's an even better area. If I can find open ridges, like a south facing ridge, something that's going to be open where there's going to be some feed, elk are going to be more likely to be on those ridges first thing in the morning. And then if I can find water, which on Google Earth is going to be represented by really green drainages or draws the lower country, if I can see that there's water there and you can change image date on Google Earth, you can see exactly when the image was taken. So if you're looking in May, you're probably going to find a lot more water than if you're looking at an image from September. So be sure you, you keep that in mind. Once I find those three areas, if I'm looking at a huge range like we have here, I can probably pick six or seven areas out of everything that you can see around here that are gonna hold those three things. And then I can triangulate them and say, this area is gonna hold elk, this area is gonna hold elk, this area is gonna hold elk. And I mark those. And then I say, if I'm parking here at this trailhead, I'm gonna leave here, the thermals are coming down first thing in the morning, I wanna be going up against the thermals, I wanna hit this point, this point, and this point, and here's a ridge system that'll get me there. As far as specific vantage points, I don't worry too much about that. All I wanna do is get to where I can bugle into those areas with the wind in my favor. And then as the thermals change, I'm looking, here's point B, C, D, whatever the other points are. I want to be above them as I hit this ridge system and call down into them once the thermals have changed. And so that's how I set up my day hunts is there, there's a strategy to it. I don't worry about uh, necessarily getting to a, an exact X on the map and bugling from there. It's just more, here's a basin that has everything elk need here's a ridge that goes by there. I want to bugle into that basin from that ridge. And when they're not bugling and you're rifle hunting, uh, that's a glassing game in the post rut or the late season. And you have to be a little more precise in your plan. Uh, you're walking in in the dark, you want to be there 
when the sun comes up and it's legal shooting light, you want to be on your spot. So how do you know that when the sun comes up, you're not going to be surrounded by a big grove of trees and you can't see anything? It's kind of a problem that a lot of... I, 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 I make some assumptions and I probably shouldn't, and that's just decades of being a topo map junkie. I've got enough old style paper topo maps that I could paper my floors of my entire house with maps. Now with Google Earth and with OnX, I know how I, if I put like on OnX, I hit either the hybrid mode or the topo mode, I can visualize what that looks like just by looking at topo lines. I'm looking at some place that has maybe, okay, the whole face has a certain type of, of uh, strata to the topo lines, and then there's one really steep, thick place. Well, I know that's probably a rock face. So if I'm on that, the trees are gonna be down below me. They can't grow on that steep of a face. So, okay, that's probably gonna be a good glassing spot. I, try to mark as many of those as I can, multiple glassing spots. And if people want practice of trying to understand what does a topo lines look like versus uh, on a map versus what they look like in reality, don't necessarily wait to do that on your hunt. Do it around home, do it in other places so that you look at a map and say, oh, I wonder, I think this looks like this. Hike in there, maybe it's only 500 yard hike, but you'll start learning what a topo map is telling you versus what it really looks like on the landscape. And Google Earth, yeah, like Corey said, the, the 3D view is, is really, really good. Um, and we've done a whole series of e-scouting last year. It's 12 video series of e-scouting. And you'll see that we really focus first and foremost on what is the season we're hunting. And that determines what the need of the elk is at that time. And they are going to be in the places where they can satisfy that need at that time of year. Well, now that starts telling me, here are the places they are going to be. And I start building these plans of, all right, area A, I know I've got a glassing point here and here and here and here. And I think this one's the best morning glassing spot. This one over here, 800 yards away, is probably a better evening glassing spot. I may not predict it perfectly, but over time and over practice and, and using as many uh, sources to get a visual of what it is, Google Earth, Onyx, all of them, uh, I, I get a pretty good feel. Google Earth has right the little uh, green triangles. You click on it, and it's an actual image of, that someone took from that location. Uh, every area I go to, I'm clicking on every little image on my Google Earth area. And it just gives you a really good visual of, oh, that's what it looks like from there. So there's, I, I think a lot of it is you learn it over time, but don't just wait until your elk hunt to go and learn that. Be learning it in the spring. You, I mean, spring bear hunting. I would say more of my spring bear hunting is elk scouting than it is actual spring bear hunting. And maybe you don't live somewhere where you can do that, but if you have time and come out west and do it, and wherever you live, maybe you're out shed antler hunting or whatever, there's probably activities where you can be learning this stuff and getting a, a feel for it in your head all year round rather than just, well, okay, I've got my Colorado elk hunt in September or November or whatever. So not a science, but it's how we do it. And that 12 video series should hopefully give you some more ideas. And just to add to that, the, the, beauty of Google Earth is that you can save these waypoints. You can create an actual map, a path. I'm going to start here. I'm going to hike up to this. I'm going to go over to this side. Then I'm going to come across here and back down. You can save that and you can go right on the computer on your OnX and save it to there and transfer it there. And it automatically shows up on your phone. So when you hit the trailhead, you open up OnX on your phone and you start hiking to that exact point. And it like Randy said, you've got to be flexible because typically you aren't going to just walk right up this point, be like, wow, this is exactly what I thought it looked like. I'm going to bugle in there and an elk's going to answer, but it's going to get you into those areas where you're going to be able to fine tune and say, I know there's got to be elk in here. I'm either going to bugle from here or I need to get up on that rock outcropping and start glassing and really dial it in from there. So, great question. Who's next? So the question uh, is... Uh, uh, you're going to answer it. Okay. So the question is, <laughs> when it's super thick timber... What, what, what do I do? What are some tactics in archery season for hunting super thick timber and being able to see these elk? Did I say that right? 
Okay. I, I would say that 75% of my elk hunting is done without optics. I don't even carry binoculars a lot of the time because I don't hunt areas where you can spot them. I'm not worried about spotting them. I'm using my bugle tube to locate elk. And so I grew up in North Idaho. It's thick. We aren't hunting areas where we can glass. Uh, we hunted Roosevelt elk last year. There's, you don't even need range finders there because it's just, it's thick. So my strategy there is to cover a lot of country and bugle and get in that thick country with them. I prefer hunting that more than the wide open stuff. You know, something like here in the breaks or something, it's really open. I think that's harder to call elk and it's harder to, to move around without getting spotted. So I like the thick stuff. Uh, I didn't know what a shooting lane was until I moved down to southern Idaho. And I always thought a shooting lane was you hike through the brush until you can see 10 yards and you set up there and hope the elk walks into that opening. And now I've, I've found like where we live in central Idaho, there's a lot of pine. There's a lot of, we have good 40 to 60 yard shooting lanes. And that's kind of my, my preferred area to hunt. But in those really thick areas, you're relying on, on bugles. So if you're archery hunting during the rut, getting in there, you aren't probably going to spot anything. And if you want to focus on a specific bull, you know, trail cameras are going to be your, your only friend there. But as far as strategies, I just hike. You, you know, you're still going to have ridges. You're still going to have vantage points, not that you glass from, but that you call from, calling into those basins. And again, setup, like I mentioned earlier, setup is the nemesis. And when you get in that thick stuff, even more so, you've got to really just choose those setups the best you can and make the best out of them. I'm glad that he asked if it was archery season or rifle season because the answer, I would have a completely different answer if it was rifle season. Yeah, and that's why I asked because it is different hunting the thick stuff with archery versus rifle. Rifle is, I mean, I won't say impossible, but nearly impossible to hunt the really thick stuff because they're there in sanctuary mode. They're there to escape pressure and you just wandering around with a rifle and hoping to spot one at 20 yards before it jumps up and runs off is incredibly tough, so. Very tough. And in rifle season, the elk densities in that super, super big blanket of dark timber, like say the big hole area of southwest Montana, there's the big vast tracts of dark timber. There are elk in there, but the elk densities are really, really low. And there's not a lot of feed in there for them. So once they get done with their breeding, i.e. rut period, and they start going to big tracts of dark timber, they have to be finding pockets to feed in, and there's not a lot of that in just the big carpet of dark timber. So then you start dissecting these big pockets or these big carpets. Where are the small canopy disruptions? Where are the small fringe habitats? That's where they're going to be if it was in rifle season. So who's next? So the question is on a three to five day backpack hunt, whether it's archery season or in late November, What's kind of your food, what, what does your pantry look like uh, that you carry with you based on those varying conditions? And then lastly, what is the one backcountry meal that you absolutely have to try? Yeah, so I think it probably changes, I think, from archery to, to rifle season. But for me, um, I always overpack on food. I always come back with food left over. And I think I'd rather have that than the opposite where I get hungry. Because when you get hungry, if you aren't putting the right nutrients into your body and keeping just built up on food and, and just the energy that comes from that, you, you can crash after three to five days pretty hard to the point where you can't go over the next ridge, to the point where you want to give up and, and head back. So nutrition is important. Uh, I rely, especially on back, even, even when we're base camp hunting, I still rely on dehydrated meals. Just because we get back at 11 o'clock at night to camp, I don't want to spend any time cooking a meal, cleaning up a meal. I want to boil water, dump it in there, wait 10 minutes, get everything ready for the next day while I'm waiting eat it and fall asleep. And so uh, dehydrated meals for, for dinner, and that's primarily all we have. For breakfast, I usually have a breakfast bar or some kind of a protein shake. And then throughout the day, I'll have some trail mix, some jerky, uh, protein bar, granola bar, uh, just lightweight, but good. I always look at the, the nutrients to make sure the calories are up where they need to be and that I'm getting enough protein. I don't want to get all carbs, but carbs are good during, during hunting season. So uh, for that, I, I basically take a Ziploc bag and for every day I have Monday written on it and I have all my food for Monday. And then on Tuesday, I have another bag and I really try to stick with that. And when I have leftover, I put it in the next day's bag or I, I build a leftover bag and carry that. 
As far as one food item, there's a couple, and, and actually I have to give credit to Cody Rich with Backcountry Fuel Box. So Cody started Backcountry Fuel Box, and every month you get a box with backcountry foods in it. And sometimes it's breakfast meals, sometimes it's you know bars, sometimes it's dehydrated meals. And I've got a chance to be introduced to a lot of stuff I didn't realize was out there. And so uh, there's a green belly bar that I really like. It's, I want to say, 800 calories or something in this bar. And I take one of those probably for every other day. And I could literally live off of that, I think, for the day if I had to. Uh, that's been good. Uh, there's some F-bomb macadamia nut butter. It's just a little pouch and it's 160 or 180 calories of good fats uh, that I carry those. I've found those um, honey stinger, wa the waffles that honey stinger makes are great. Uh, Peak is a, is a great dehydrated and I'm just throwing out what I personally use and I think brand is, uh, I've, I've tried just about everything out there and those are kind of what I've dialed in just based on taste and, and nutrition, so. Randy for later season. Yeah, I would uh, uh, agree with uh, Cody's backcountry fuel box. I did not. I thought you were stuck to whatever is hanging on the shelf at, you know, some store. Uh, the backcountry fuel box has opened my mind to a lot of things, and I'm probably not the best person to answer the question because I have a weird liver condition that I'm relegated to 40 grams of protein a day. If you think about that, the average American t consumes anywhere from 200 to 300 grams of protein a day. So if I take in too much protein, I have a lot of problems. So if you looked at my foods, <laughs> my camera crew does not let me do the shopping for what we're <laughs> going to eat in the back country. Uh, but there are times where I just have to splurge and get the protein because you do need enough protein for the muscle mass and everything. Um, they're Alpine, I think it's called Alpine Air. They have a, a lime chicken, which I didn't think that you could have rehydrated chicken that was any good, but I found that that's, that's pretty good. Uh, the stingers that Corey mentioned, man, I like those. There's a new cookie I've been eating the last year. It's made out of crickets, right, in Belgrade, Montana. It's a cricket something, a cricket cookie. Cricket that, cookie, yeah. yeah. Chocolate chip cookie, it's better than, it's almost as good as mom's homemade chocolate chip cookies. And some would say, boy, your mom must have made really bad chocolate chip cookies if you think I that. was going to say, you can't read the ingredients list and no, eat that. You, no, you don't read the ingredients list. I, I, I seldom read ingredients lists. But, uh, and the other thing I will say that there was a time in my life where I did a lot of backcountry three to five day hunts. But I've found now... Uh, uh, balancing that with base camp hunts, I have more success when I have a base camp that gives me the mobility to go into some place for a day and check it out and eh, no, too much hunting pressure. The next day I come back to my base camp and I go to a different direction. So I'm doing less and less of that. So I'm, I'm not packing these three to five day type meals, but the amount of calories I consume on a November elk hunt, whether it's a base camp or a backpack hunt, I almost cannot carry enough food. It's, that's where llamas come in. <laughs> they can carry a lot of food. But like Corey, I usually overpack also. Um, I, uh, that's very non-scientific and any nutritionist listening to this is like, hold on, shut up, Newberg. <laughs> You're giving them all the wrong advice. But that's just how it works for me. Yeah, and I, I think water is a big thing when we talk about nutrition and, and making sure we're hydrated. So I've started carrying a lot more water the last four or five years, but having too much food, and, and I'm not talking, I'm carrying an extra six pounds of food a day or anything, but last year in Wyoming, I think we hunted nine days. We averaged, I think, nine miles a day or 10 miles a day. So we we're high 80s in nine days. The last night of the hunt hiking out, I'd eaten all my food on that hunt. I'd eaten all my food that day. And I was begging the three guys who were with us for food in the dark on the way out. I was like, I'm going to crash. My stomach feels like it's eating itself here. I can't get enough calories. I want to say I had 4,600 calories that day. And it's, you know, at the end of nine days, I didn't eat that much every day. But that day, I couldn't get enough food in me. And I could feel it. I was getting weak and shaky. And so it's, I'd much rather have an extra two pounds in my pack and know I have a reserve there. Yeah, peak refuel. If, uh, yeah. And they just came out with, I think, some new flavors here recently. I haven't tried them yet, but last year I tried, they had a chicken Alfredo that was really good, and I don't, they've got some 
great flavor. I have a rule on dehydrated foods. If it sticks to your spork and you can't get rid of it on that trip, like some of the tomato sauces and cheeses and spaghettis and lasagnas, I don't think you can get it out of your stomach either. Add more I, I, water. No, I just add more water. Just get rid of it. Breakfast. There's a company. I when I see it on the shelf, I remember what company it is. But there's a raspberry granola that is really, really good. I, I actually eat that sometimes at home. It's that good of a breakfast meal. So, who's next? All right. So the question for Corey is that sometimes you notice that the elk are really vocal in the morning and then sometimes maybe they're really vocal in the afternoon. Do I hang around all day and say, well, I, I hope that they get vocal, uh, even if they're not? Yeah, and so a couple things to keep in mind. Elk are vocal in the morning primarily because they're on the move and they communicate to keep everything, you know, keep the herd together. So. When elk are on the move, and if you think about what an elk's doing throughout the day, in the mornings are typically at lower elevation. That's where they've spent the night. That's where they've fed. That's where they've gotten water. That's where they've bedded down. Thermals are all coming down into that lower area, so they're protected by their senses at night. In the morning, they're going to linger in that area for a little bit, and then they're going to start traveling up the hill to where they bed. And the reason they're traveling up the hill is because the thermals are still coming down, so they can smell any danger ahead of them. About the time they get to that bedding area, they mill around a little bit, the thermals change. Now anything that's down below them or that's been following up the hill, they're able to smell that. And then they bed in that area throughout the day, and before the thermals change at night, they're back up milling around, they're moving down the ridge, Thermals are still coming up. About the time they hit that low country, thermals change, and it brings any scent down to them. So all of their movements and activity throughout the day are based on their sense of smell and using the thermals to their advantage. So the reason they're more vocal in the morning is they're on the move. They're typically going up to their bedding area. So following a herd when they're on the move and very vocal, it can be hard to call them in because a bull's not going to leave his cows who are on the move to come back down the mountain to challenge another bull and take a chance that maybe another bull moves in and steals his cows. And so calling, you know, when they're very vocal and very active is not necessarily the best time to call them in. And then throughout the middle of the day, there's not a lot of vocal activity from them it's because they're bedded down. The bull knows where his cows is, where the cows are, and he doesn't have that need to keep track of them because they're bedded down. And then in the evening, again, you hear that vocal activity because they're up. They're coming down. And the other thing is when they're vocal, they're usually running around. It's in cooler in the morning, cooler in the evening. So they aren't having to worry about middle of the day, you know, overheating. So the way I would hunt that is just because they're vocal in the morning, that gives me a chance to figure out where they're going and what they're doing. So I'm going to follow them up the mountain. And then once they bed down and they're quiet, I'm going to let them lay there for an hour or so and then hunt them in the middle of the day. And it's probably the most effective time, especially for calling, to hunt an elk is in the middle of the day because that bull's not on the move anymore. He's very territorial, he's protective of his cows, and now here's this other bull that all of a sudden shows up close to him, threatening his cows and his you know, safety there. And so calling in that bull is a lot easier when he's not moving. So I definitely, those, those mornings when there's just that bull is bugling, or maybe there's a, a herd bull and two satellite bulls, they're bugling their heads off, but they're on the move. I can't get them to turn around and come back in I'm going to get on a parallel ridge. I'm just going to move along, and I might locate bugle every once in a while just to keep them talking and find out where they are. But once I get to that bedding area, that's when I'm going to get serious and, and start hunting them. Great question. Do you have more to add to that? Nope. <laughs> Unless you want me to make it up. I thought that's what we were supposed to be doing here. Oh, well, you're you, like I said, you're better at making it up. Okay. When, when you're, uh, if this was in Donnelly, Idaho, you wouldn't be making this stuff up the way you are because <laughs> the locals know you. So, who's next? So the question is water holes. What time of the day is the best time to hunt them? How long? How often do elk come into water holes? And you mentioned, you know, it used to be a lot easier to pattern an elk before wolves because they'd come to the same sources for feed and water every day. And now that they're on the move continually, they might not come to that water source until four days later again. So how do you use water holes to, to hunt elk? Yeah, a lot of that depends on where I'm at, time of year. So I'm going to give a general rule with understand there's a lot of exceptions to every rule. In the northern Rockies here, like in Montana, I would never shoot a water hole because there's water all across the landscape. If I was in Northern Idaho, I'd never shoot a water hole. There's water all across the landscape. I hate sitting water, but I do it 
because sometimes that's all you can do. Last year in New Mexico, Corey and I were doing a podcast yesterday about cow elk hunting and how sitting water can be really effective. Well, last year in New Mexico, I've got this supposed premium tag, oh, you're going to shoot a big bull, you know, you're going to have to fend them off kind of the expectation. 90 degrees, no, can't raise a bugle. So uh, my, my experience is sitting water in the morning is very difficult uh, in that you're, you're going to struggle to get in there without them hearing, smelling, or seeing you. And they are probably have already watered before shooting light, and they're starting to repeat the pattern Corey was just talking about, how they're using the thermals to go to a bedding area. So for me, I usually am not going to start sitting a water hole until about 11 o'clock in the morning and I might sit it all day. And there's two reasons, one in the rut, and I've seen it way too many times to discount that this is just a rant or, or to assume this is a random pattern. Especially later in September when the bulls have their group of cows of 12, 15 cows, these big bulls, they push those cows up with the thermals, get up there, mill around, they put them to bed. They're so active and the temperatures are high enough that they cannot get enough water by just watering in the morning and just watering in the evening. So many times those big old bulls will come down solo, completely quiet once the cows are bedded. And I've had them come walking into water at noon, at one o'clock, at two o'clock and they silently go back to their cows. So that's why I say I'd be, I wouldn't hesitate to be there by 11 o'clock because a lot of times that herd bull will come down. A lot of them get shot one, two in the afternoon, coming down solo. And then in the evening, when they're repeating that process and they're trying to use the thermals, while the thermals are still going uphill, they're trying to get most of the way down there to take advantage of that and they might mill around and wait. Uh, for the thermals to, to change again before they come in and water. But uh, I, if I'm sitting water, as much as I hate to do it, I, I will sit there all day long once I get there. Uh, and I want to be there well in advance before they are. And we talked about this a lot uh, yesterday on that podcast. It's, I'm trying to anticipate what's the wind going to be doing when they're coming in. Not what is it doing when I get to the blind or get to my setup. What is it going to be doing at the time they're coming down? And then I try to set up in a place that even though when I walk in there, it might be like, this is a screwed up wind. The wind is going to be good later on in the afternoon. And I, I may not sit on the water itself. I might sit 100 yards away on the trail that I know they take down to water because there's a corner there or there's something that gives me a little bit of advantage of the wind. Uh, also, when I'm scouting, I'm checking tracks. I want to see, do they use this trail to leave the water and a different trail to come to the water? There's a lot that those tracks can tell you about how they're using the water. Um, and that, again, it's, that's a general answer, but uh, you, you know, hopefully you get the, the gist of it's still about the wind. It's about using their daily patterns and behaviors and being there for the ambush rather than you going to them. And just one thing to add to that, you know, when we talk about water, there's also wallows during the rut, and, and those are going to be different. I mean, you're going to need to set up the same way, thinking about the wind and everything, but when you find a wallow that's actively being used, that bull's probably going to be there around the same time every day. And the reason why is the wallows are usually close to a bedding area, usually on a north face, and there, there's exceptions to that for sure, but if I find a wallow on a north face that's active, I know I'm close to a bedding area because that bull usually goes and puts his cows to bed, and then like Randy said, we'll get up around 11 o'clock and come into that wallow, and then before they come down in the evening, he might hit it again. So I would say any time from 10 until 5 or 6 in the evening would be a good time to sit a wallow during that middle of the day is, is the most likely time they're going to hit it. And again, if there's a wallow down in the low country in the fields where they've been feeding all night, they might hit it during the middle of the night. They might hit it, you know, first thing in the morning before they head up. So it really depends on knowing the elk in that area and, and what their habits are. All right. Uh oh, this is going to be a hard one. I can see he's been waiting for us. So the question, asking for a friend, it sounds like, a friend from Missouri. Uh, I love these asking for a friend from Missouri kind of questions. But uh, is there an open read call that works as well, or can people have success the same as when you use a diaphragm call? Is that, did I get that? Do, do you have to use a, a mouth call like a diaphragm call to be 
world class was the term used. To world be effective. class effective. Yeah, world class effective. Okay. However, so, I like that. All right. World class effective. So, I think the the benefit of a diaphragm call is the versatility and the range of sounds you can make with it, and the control that you can get out of it. So, diaphragm call. If if you're here and you haven't seen one yet, hold on just one second. I'm going to use this as a prop. So. Diaphragm call goes in your mouth. And there are some people that have gag reflexes that cannot put it in. We had Jordan Harbertson from Mountain Ops. We did a, a seminar down in Utah this winter. His brother put him on the spot because he, he thinks it's so funny to watch him gag. So he put it in and he tried calling with it and he just spit it out. And I mean, he's gagging and it's funny, but it's not funny because you can't use them for hunting. So the, the benefit is you can use a diaphragm to make every sound, every cow call, every bugle, everything. And it's so versatile, but then it's also so realistic because you can control it right down to the exact sound you want to make. The downside of using like an open reed uh, cow call or uh, some other kind of a bugle is that you just don't get that range and you don't get that versatility. With that being said, there are uh, a couple of options. An open reed cow call has a really good sound. The problem is it has one really good sound. So you don't get a lot of variety, but you can absolutely call in bulls just using an open reed cow call. And then there's a, like the selectable uh, bugle system that has a conqueror mouthpiece. So it's basically they take the frame out of a diaphragm and they pop it on top of a mouthpiece. And then you can use that to call. There's a green tongue that actually it takes the place of your tongue and all you have to do is bite on it at that point. And the harder you bite, the more pressure it puts on the latex, so you're able to hit that high note. And you can get a good sounding bugle out of that. Again, there's no range to it. It's the same sounding bugle. If you pull that green tongue off and use your own tongue or your lip, you can actually get almost a full range of bugles. You can chuckle with it and everything. So there are options that'll still be somewhat limited, but not as limited. But if you can learn to use a diaphragm, it's hands down, the most realistic sounding uh, apparatus to make elk calls. The other thing is if you're an archery hunter, having a diaphragm in your mouth to stop an elk when it walks in front of you is, is really a, an important thing. And you know, an elk comes by into a setup and if you're at full draw, you aren't gonna squeeze a hoochie mama. You aren't going to blow on a, on a, a bugle or anything. You need a diaphragm to cow call. So, uh, yeah, most realistic sounding, I think the most versatile and most functional for, especially for archery hunting. If you wondered why Corey looked over at me with all that emphasis about if an elk walks into an opening, amateur hour in New Mexico in 2016, we've been hiking miles and miles and Corey is playing his flute, man. He's the Pied Piper and there is a bull that just wants to be a TV star. Finally, the setup comes in and the bull starts coming in and I realize that I don't have my diaphragm in my mouth. And Corey's up the hill, he can see everything going on and here comes this bull walking through the brush. And I got an opening that's about seven or eight yards wide that he's got to stop in and he'll be at about 23, 24 yards. And he's looking at Corey up this way and I got two cameras over my shoulder and the bull steps in there and I go, <laughs> I, my mouth is dry, I'm spitting. I'm, finally, I try the old whitetail thing, right? And the bull just keeps walking, right? And finally, he stops in the brush on the other side of the opening. I'm at full draw, thinking he was going to maybe go into the next opening. Well, bulls are smart. They stop and they're, he's, the bull's now looking for Corey, but he's in the brush. Bulls don't have to be smart to know they need to get in the brush when they hear the sound that you made. All right. So uh, <laughs> the, the bull runs off and I kind of walk up to Corey with my head down because I know I'm about ready to have to confess that I made. This was on like day six, and I think the second elk we had called in in six days of hunting. Yeah, and he's like, what, what happened? Why, why, why didn't you stop him? And I'm trying to think. I was going to lie and say, well, I swallowed my diaphragm or something, but he knows that I would have choked if that was the case. So I just said... I didn't have my diaphragm in my mouth. And he just grabbed his pack and he took off. <laughs> I mean, he was like ridge after ridge after ridge. And the camera guys are like, are we going to catch him? I'm like, I don't know. I mean, he's like Forrest Gump, man. He's just going to run until he's tired of running, I guess. He's mad at me. 
Point being, <laughs> the beauty of a diaphragm is it is hands off, but if it's not in your mouth, it's not hands off. <laughs> it's just no good. So that's why all of you saw him do that. That, that. He still is mad about that. That's why he gives me that look when that topic comes up. <laughs> so, I'm not mad about it. I, okay. Just well, like okay. to remind you. Okay, maybe Le- the, forgi- up to the forgiveness has happened, but the forgetting has not. <laughs> so who's next? So the question is, <laughs> e-scouting, virtual scouting, you know, we do a lot of talking about mountainous terrain, north faces and, and drainages and water sources and everything, but what about when you get to open country? What about something like the Missouri breaks or hunting the grasslands in New Mexico like we did? What's, what's the differences there and what do you look for in e-scouting? Yeah, and again, the very first question always is, what season are you hunting? Archery season, okay. So it would be a completely different answer for me if it was rifle season versus archery season. Archery season, the elk are gonna be way more mobile moving across the landscape than they probably are in the later rifle season. They're gonna be more of a sanctuary. I'm going here, I'm gonna get through hunting season. I'm not gonna move a lot. So in an archery season, e-scouting, it's gonna be hot. I'm probably gonna be looking for water sources and the cows are gonna be on food sources. And so the best food source on the landscape is where the cows are going to be. And that's where the bulls are going to be come mid-September. So I'm going to be looking for those two things, water and the best feed. And I hunt the Missouri breaks a lot. So I have kind of a shortcut to how I do it now. Uh, If it was someplace that I don't hunt, I would be learning an awful lot about what is the preferred food source in September because that's where the cows are going to be. It's not gonna be about roadless areas. It's not gonna be about sanctuaries. If it was rifle season, I'd be doing an e-scout or virtual scouting plan on a completely different basis about sanctuaries and other stuff. So when I'm doing them for archery, it's a whole lot about food sources and it's a whole lot about water. Sure, Uh uh-oh, follow-up question. He wants your answer to this, I think, Corey. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, so the question here is, well, as far as water, are you looking for how they're going to access the water? Because the entire Missouri River flows along the boundary unit. But if you get up out of the breaks, there's water scattered across the landscape in small places. So then I'm going to look at, all right, where's water that's close to bedding cover and close to those food sources I've identified? Because even then, they want to, they, they want to go about their business with the least amount of disruption as possible. In that case with all that water along the Missouri River, I'm not using water when I'm focusing on the part of the breaks near the river. I'm using heavily food sources and a little bit of escapement terrain because I've hunted it enough to know that some people walk up to the edge of the breaks and say, wow, that's beautiful, but I don't want to pack an elk out of there. Um, and those little pockets of food that are in there, it, that clover, that yellow clover stuff right now, right? And Fort Peck is just loaded with that right now. It's a wet year out there. So this kind of a wet year, that food is going to be dispersed in great abundance across the landscape. So it's going to be hard to say they're going to be in this spot or that spot. So then you got to use the Corey technique of I'm going to be a ridge runner, man. I'm going from this spot to this spot to this spot to this spot to this spot, and I'm calling and I'm trying to locate. And even if they shut up, if I at least hear they are there, then I know I got a place to go hunting. And uh, when I do my e-scouting plans for archery, they're not real specific spots. They're more general areas because the elk aren't sticking to specific spots. They're using the entire landscape or the entire part of this area. And I just got to be in there and be mobile like they are. So I guess a question back to you, Randy, with your experience there, do you find that the elk are watering in the river? Oh, yeah. The, a, a lot of, uh, the, the elk along the river corridor, water in the river. The elk up on the benches go in water on usually man-made cattle tanks, uh, berm, you know, the, the dirt tanks, stuff like that. And they, the ones up above will travel two, three miles to water. The ones that are in the break country, they don't got to go very far. They just walk down to the river. And sometimes they're, they're, there's flooded willows and stuff out there. They'll go hang out in the flooded willows. They aren't feeding out there. They're bedding out there. And they're getting their water in the river. They're coming up and they're feeding up on the actual shoreline and, and up above in the breaks. 
Interesting. And I, I ask that because I've hunted a couple river areas and it seems like the elk aren't actually watering in the river. They're finding other water sources. They aren't actually coming all the way down to the banks of the river. They're watering in a spring or they're watering you know, in, a, in a creek that feeds into it, but not actually coming all the way down. I think it has a lot to do with pressure and roads along the river system more than anything, but I just yeah. interested in that. And we, we put together a lot of e-scouting plans for a place like New Mexico. It's all kind of a big flat, you know, just undulations. And again, we're focusing on water sources and a lot of those are man-made water sources. And you better have a whole bunch of them located in an area because like when we were there, the rancher who had the grazing allotment turned off all of his water sources because he'd moved his cattle. Well, if you looked at uh, an aerial view, you can tell these water sources because they look like a spoke and a hub on a, on a bicycle tire, right? All these trails coming into one little dot. Well, guess what? That's a man-made water source right there. And if you have a whole bunch of those in your plan, you better hope that some of them are still working. That's why I always want to have at least one dirt tank or two dirt tanks or three, because dirt tanks, it's not like they can turn the well off on a dirt tank. But if it's a, like one of those concrete or metal water tanks, they turn the well off and those dry up really quickly. So if I go there and that my whole plan is predicated on water sources that I think the, the allotment grazer is going to leave his pumps on into October after his cattle are gone, I'm, the elk might completely vacate to a different part of the unit because of that. So my e-scouting plan becomes a little different in a situation like that. So I guess I have a question. Yeah. Did, did anybody tell us the time we have to quit talking or did we just get Yeah, a- no, they, the, the Elk Foundation is gonna uh, pull all those raffle tickets over there. In fact, we've got time for one <laughs> more question. Can we make it two? I think we're down to one. All right. Guys, we're already over. All right. But this guy's been patiently waiting, so we're going to have to do one more and then call it good. So if you're from the Midwest, the question is, if you're from the Midwest, say in this case Minnesota, and you work for Shields, uh, and you uh, come out here and you can't really scout the way that everybody else does who lives here, what are the little, how would you approach it? And then what are the little tidbits that you wish someone would have told, told us along the way? Since you repeated the question, I guess you're pointing that at me to answer? Well, kind of. I answered the last question. <laughs> you expect me to do all the work around here. All right. Th- this is going to be a shameless plug, but do we have any members of the University of Elk Hunting online course here? Would you say there's any value in it for a new elk hunter from the Midwest? Everybody, look at that. Everybody who said they were a member said there was... Well, you had 100% success, Gordon. Excellent. The, huh. the only reason I bring that up is... There is so much to learn about elk hunting. It's just not something that I can say, here's the one thing that's going to make you successful. There's just, I mean, in the, in the online course, there's 17 modules broken down into 54 chapters. It's 130,000 words. It'll take you six months to read through it and learn it. And that's everything I know about elk hunting in there. And so to, to break it down into one thing is tough. If I could give you one thing, it would be sign up for the online course because you're going to you're going to learn a lot about elk hunting and you're going to be able to apply that and the other thing is when you go and elk hunt a light bulb's going to come on you and be like I remember reading about this specific situation whereas when you go out blind into a a whole new universe of elk hunting there when something happens you don't understand what's happening so you can't make the correction for it and so I think it's important to have a foundation when you experience things to be able to make the correction or to say I did it right I'm going to keep doing that. And so I guess that would be my, my shameless way of saying that's the one thing. But beyond that, learn thermals. Know thermals inside and out. I think that's the, the thing that most people uh, don't pay enough attention to. And it costs them more opportunities because the elk are gone before they even hear them bugle the first time. They're 500 yards up on a ridge. The wind's going down and they're walking along bugling down as they make their way down this ridge. And... The elk have already smelled them and left the area, and they say, I, I didn't see any elk, I didn't hear any elk, and there's a reason for that. So I think the thermals would be number one thing to learn about and pay attention to. From there, everything else will, will fall into place as you get that experience. Uh, I will add a few other things to that. Is One, when I moved out west from the Midwest, I was accustomed to hunting 
200 acres, 300 acres was like a pretty big place. And when you come and you see the vastness of this landscape, it's just flat out intimidating. It's like, where do I start? Understand that there's way more terrain out here that doesn't hold elk than there is terrain that holds elk. And the, the elk are in certain places at certain times of the year for a reason. So be thinking about this as not just hunting the little 100 acre woodlot that maybe you're accustomed to uh, in, in the Midwest. And I, I, it, it is intimidating. It, it's very intimidating. And then the, to that point of how you help eliminate the places where the elk aren't is knowing as much as you can about elk. And you can learn a lot of that online. You can read books. You can learn what do they eat? Where's their preferred bedding? I mean, the one thing I'm always surprised at is how few people have read the Starkey Experimental Forest Studies about where elk prefer to bed. Elk prefer to bed on a slope that is less than 20 degrees. So I instantly know if, if I'm looking for bedded elk, I'm not going to look on a 40 degree slope. Elk also prefer to bed whether it's the, the main ridge or one of the finger ridges, they like to bed in the top third of the ridge. Well, that means if I'm wasting all my time on the bottom two thirds of the ridge, I'm probably wasting more of my time than I'm utilizing my time. So I just use those as two little tidbit examples that if you, are, you become a student of elk, you will quickly, I, I guess, uh, shorten your learning or flatten your learning curve and i i didn't have al gore hadn't invented the internet when i started <laughs> elk hunting so uh i gotta quit saying that i get so uh, people are so sensitive these days i can't even make a joke about al gore saying he invented the internet without getting lit up it's like i i, I pick on all flavors so I, I can't wait for our podcast from yesterday on hunting cow elk to come out because you talked a lot about climate change so that's going to be a good one. Yeah. Between Al Gore inventing the internet and creating climate change, we're, uh, we're in for trouble. We're done. We're down the tubes, end of the story. But anyhow, it, the point is that elk are not... Uh, the, as a whitetail hunter, what Corey said about thermals, you guys are really good at the wind. That, that's one of the skills whitetail hunters have that translates super well to elk hunting, is you pay meticulous attention to the wind. But the flip side of that is there are some things about whitetail hunting that are hard to break the mold, about being mobile, about not being intimidated by a vast landscape, and then learning how to eliminate from your map all the places where elk likely are not. And that will give you more of likely where they are. Yeah, and one, you know, one thing to say about wind and whitetail hunters, I think you place your stands you know, based on what the wind is doing to give you the best chance of success and you have several different stands and based on where the winds are coming out of you hunt a different stand so you have the most success and just understanding elk hunting is dynamic it's not based on tree stands now you've got a mountain where the thermals might be going down on this side because you've got a north face where the ground is still cool and just 60 yards away on an open hillside the thermals are going up or you know the transition of thermals in the morning is going to change at 9 15 because that's when the ground gets warmed up by the sun and you're following these elk up the mountain, you have perfect wind, it's coming right in your face, and all of a sudden it switches and swirls and goes up. And just understanding how thermals work in the mountains, how the wind works, and just using that to your advantage instead of hoping that it, that it works out is, yeah. that's a big part of it. Yeah. And so. probably another thing is, <laughs> I grew up still hunting whitetails in the big woods of northern Minnesota, man. I just creep in trying to be as quiet as possible. And so many times, an elk's moving across the landscape at three miles an hour, and I'm creeping along at 0.2 miles an hour. And I wonder why I can never catch up to him. And as an example, we're in uh, Arizona, a great guy, Lee Havemeyer from Minnesota. Uh, he's out there with us. And some elk, he's, he glassed him up. And I'm like, we got to get over there. And I just took off running. And he's looking at me like, what are you trying to do? Scare him away? I'm like, no, I want to get there before they get there. And Lee ends up shooting one of those bulls. And he told me, he's like, when you took off running like that, I thought you were nuts. Elk are noisy animals. They're not like whitetails where they're just going to come creeping through. When an elk decides he's going somewhere, 
He doesn't care who hears him or whatever. Now, if he's coming in to your call, he's going to be really quiet. But when he's getting somewhere, you got to be getting somewhere also. So I think uh, noise, people, people, whitetail hunters have a tendency to think you're going to scare every elk away when you're going through the woods. But if you ever listen to how much el- uh, noise elk make going through the woods, it's almost as bad as cattle going through the woods. So, uh, And if I can... If you're interested in signing up for the online course, we do have a discount code that'll save you 20%. And Randy, what's the, what's the promo code? I have no idea. Wow. Is it Randy? <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's a promo code I use for everything. Always, would it be, you're would always it be thinking elk about t- yourself. Is it Elk Talk? Elk Talk. Oh, there you go. So, All right. I'm, use code Elk Talk, save you 20%. I was just trying to ease in on a little bit of commission there or something. But, <laughs> so... Anyhow, folks, we really appreciate it. Thanks for all being here. And uh, I hope that the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation has all these raffles here. And the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation does so much for elk and other wildlife. They make this podcast possible. They have a membership booth down there, uh, down the way. I think we've actually moved the membership. Uh, Matt, have we brought the membership opportunity right here to the Sitka tent? Uh, he's, he's not paying attention to me. Anyhow, go see Matt. Can they, can, can they sign up to be members here now? All right, they brought the membership booth up here. But the real question is, did they bring the dilly bars? I don't know if they did, but <laughs> here, all right. I don't know how many of you are life members of the Elk Foundation, but there's a really cool thing going on. If, if you want to be, Matt's got the form. And for the first five people who will become a life member today, I'll pay your first $200. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I just Michael, signed up. All right. I, <laughs> do, do, what, what do I got to do? This guy's going to ride me hard, I know, because he, I was giving them a little grief last night, but whatever. I, I've got at least, how many do we need, Matt? All right. Two, two firearms. firearms for every five we sell, and we've sold what? Four? Sold four. So we need one more? All right. Or this is getting too complicated. Matt's going to tell you, but I just tell you right now, I'm, I'm good for $200 towards each life membership for the next five people who sign up for it. And you'll get a 40% chance of winning a rifle if you sign up as a life member today. There you go. That worked. Come see Matt, the guy with the green RMEF shirt. And they are raising money uh, for access, for habitat. And we hope that you'll support them the way that uh, they're helping bring... If you can call this good information. <laughs> <laughs> it's questionable. Oh. Oh, this is the last event where the second rifle incentive. So if you don't do it at this event, your odds go from 40% down to 20%. Am I right in that? There you go. I'm an accountant. I can do math. I can't call out, but I, you, want, you want some math, man? I'm the Charlie Daniels of the calculator here. So, uh, But anyhow, thanks, everyone. We yeah, really thank appreciate you. it.